okay? Lord, thank you so much that you meet us in many, many different ways. You speak to us in many different, through many different things and different kinds of people and circumstances. But there is a way. You have your ways. Help us to see those ways, how you work, how we follow. You speak very personally, even at the, in the most, even when we find ourselves in the toughest places today. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. So remember, what's tomorrow? What's tomorrow? Monday. And then after that? Christmas Eve. And on Christmas Eve... Thank you. There is two services on Christmas Eve, or candlelight services. And um, there, those services are at 6 and 7.30. And so we really want you to come. It's a great thing to invite people to. The services, I don't preach a long time. Mike does a, just lots of beautiful music and everything. I don't preach a long time because they won't let me. Uh, but but, and, uh, but at any rate... It's just a great time together. And uh, you say, well, we do our Christmas thing on Christmas Eve. That's true, and that's great. Make it centered on the Lord, you know. But if you can, or if you might think about it, maybe just fold this into your Christmas tradition. It'll take you about an hour. And, um, yeah, it's just a neat time. So you could pick one of those two services. Um, and... Um, Six o'clock and 7.30. Well, you know, we're talking about, the, we're going through the book of Luke. And Luke is the writer of the gospel of Luke um, and the book of Acts. And it's really written in, the, in this idea of a historical approach. And so the series is his story, but it's really uh, the great stories of um, of the Bible. There's many, many of them, but Luke is written in a way that's chronological. So it's written in kind of a, a chronological fashion, beginning, middle, ending. Unlike the other, many other books written in the Bible, particularly the other gospels, are not necessarily written in that way. They're more written where the theme dictates where things end up being placed. Um, we just want to encourage you because we've been going through uh, these stories about the early part of Luke or the foundations of the gospel, the origins of Christ and the foundations of the gospel. So we're going through that in these Christmas narratives. So, um, but I told you I would, um, I was working on some of these songs because I noticed that there were several of you whose names I will not mention who did not sing that much during the old hymns. They weren't over there or over there. Some of them maybe, and there could, I will not confirm or deny there could have been people toward the back that weren't singing very much. You know who you are. And I understand because a lot of our English hymn tradition are songs and melodies that are not common, and maybe we only sing a few verses of them occasionally. And I understand that. And, but I am not as nice as Pastor Mike in many, so I want you to sing because I do believe that singing is good for you. And even if it isn't good for you, hearing you sing is good for me. So I'm going to be selfish about it and make you do it. Singing is kind of uh, controlled yelling, as I've told you. And I know that most of you are pretty good at that. So I, we're going to test this out. And then I'm going to sing the verses if you do not disappoint me in the chorus, Okay. Now, that came out wrong. I will continue to sing the chorus if you disappoint me in the verses. How's that? Okay. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hill and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Not bad, but you could do better. If you sing louder, I won't make you stand up. Okay. 
Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. One more try. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hill and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. That was good, wasn't it? It's pretty good. Okay, let's try it again. Down in a lowly manger, our humble Christ was born, and God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. That Jesus Christ is born. When I am a seeker, I seek both night and day. I seek the Lord to help me and show as and he shows me the way. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hill and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain, Jesus Christ is born. When shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by night, behold, throughout the heavens, there shone a holy light. Go tell it on the mountain. Over the hills and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. The shepherds feared and trembled when low above the earth rang out an angel chorus that hailed the Savior's birth. Impressive, huh? <laughs> Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Now here's a verse I bet you haven't heard because it won't be on the Christmas channel. But it's part of the, one of the original verses. There's probably 400 verses of this song because it's a spiritual. But here it is, you ready? He made me a watchman upon the city wall. And if I am a Christian, I am the least of all. Yeah. Go tell it on the mountain. Turn over the hill and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain. Jesus Christ is born again. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hill and everywhere, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Very good. Nice job. Okay. All right. Well, you know, it is a story to tell. And we love stories, right? Because that's the primary way we learn. And that's primarily the way Jesus taught was with stories. But even in the earliest stories in the, the, the Gospel of Luke and in these early narratives, there is, you know, sometimes we hear them and we hear them and we just kind of tune them out. You know, like when you have little kids and you read them the same story over and over again and they always want to hear the same story over again. Well, with me, what I would do because I would get bored with them, I would start to improvise with the stories, which I won't do, I promise, with this. But I would like use an Irish accent or I would change it into different, just to make it interesting. And of course, the, of course the, 
my children would get frustrated with me and, you know, like, what's the story your kids always wanted you to read over and over again? Anybody? Yeah, but not a Christmas story necessarily, just any little kid book. What's that? Yeah, like a little kid book is popular that you read a hundred times to them. Anybody? Like Green Eggs and Ham. What's that all about? You know? <laughs> Frog and Toad, right? Or what's the other one? Good Night, Good Night Moon, yeah? Is that it? Was that the one we do over and over again? Yeah, they know. You know, so... Sometimes we read the gospel stories, we've read through them a lot, and we kind of get in that mode, and we miss all kinds of things that God has in there. Now, of course, they're very different because these are uh, given to us by the Lord. But in these stories, there is a kernel of every other um, path to follow Jesus in each story, if you look for it. And it'll surprise you because, of course, these early narratives were before Jesus' ministry began. But in Luke chapter 2, verse 8, it says, In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there will be born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from there, from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, hey, let's go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened with the Lord, that the, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about the child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. This is a story. In its essence, it's just a story about God's great love for us. But the first part of this story, those followers, those first followers, in response to what God was doing and the origins, even the very beginnings of Jesus, even the very first, first expression of this good news, the first followers were just like us in some ways. In other words, there are some commonalities. And, they, and by the way, even though the actual uh, recounting of the narrative is true, there's a purpose in which parts of the narrative are included and the way they're included. We know that because in other parts of the book of Luke in particular, those ideas, those themes are followed. The first thing you'll find in these ideas, these lessons for the first followers are from the first followers. And by the way, if you will pay attention to the very first people who followed Jesus, and there really aren't many who are closer to it than to the beginning than these shepherds, you will find some lessons for yourself. Number one, they, like us, began in darkness. It begins in darkness. You know, it wasn't a coincidence that they brought up this incidental fact that the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. The whole issue of night coming up was, was, was it just incidental or is there a person? purpose. You know, the reality is the book of Luke tells us earlier in chapter one, it tells us this theme of darkness or night was a piece of the the narrative. Because remember this little fact, most of you don't often think about this, but in your Bible, you know, 
there were no verses and there were no chapters in the original version. That's all that, that was added centuries and centuries after the Bible was written. Now, those are there for your help, to help you find verses and help you be able to locate addresses. But in the original book of Luke, there were no chapters and verses. It was just a story, and it all ran together. And so when you read your Bible, and sometimes preachers do this, they make a big, they, they, these artificial um, added chapters and verses can sometimes cause us to miss things. We don't, we think, oh, well, that's over with. Now we're on to the new thing. And what, in chapter, the reason I say this issue of night or darkness is important because in chapter one, you'll have to look this up on your own because I thought I included it, but I didn't. Um, in chapter one, verse 77, this is Zechariah. This is just a few verses before this prophesying about what John the Baptist was going to do and what he was going to set up in the Christ, in the Savior, in the Lord coming, what his mission was. And here it was, to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercies of God with, with which the sunrise, think about it, the sunrise from on high will visit us. Isn't that beautiful? So these guys, then the next big narrative is night. The sunrise on high will visit us. Well, who's the sunrise? Jesus. To shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To guide our feet in the way of peace. Isn't that beautiful? You see, you can miss it if you don't realize that this is a story that all fits together. That the setup for Jesus' coming was, we're sitting in darkness, but the sunrise, the sunrise is gonna come and visit us. Sunrises don't visit you. <laughs> the sunrise he's talking about here is the Christ. He's coming. And so we see the picture that these shepherds were like us. They sit in darkness. They begin in darkness. Do you know that every single person's story of a relationship with God begins in darkness? You are in darkness. The Bible says he came into the world. He came into the world. His light, he was the light of men. And the light, he was the light of the world. And the light was not overcome by the darkness. The world is dark. And people sit in darkness. And those shepherds are sitting out there in darkness. It's a picture. It's a truth. It's a fact. It's something that happened. But there, this was included to give you an image of darkness. And what was the darkness that they lived in? These guys, these shepherds, they were they were the the you see in every society including ours, we have classes of people. We don't often think about it. We, we America is probably better than a lot of com play, cultures. We try to try to, you know, at least the our aspirations are for that not to happen, but it is true. Still in every society throughout history. The lowest class of people, both economically and socially, in the time of this being written were shepherds for a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, they were migrants. They were people that were, for the most part, um, lived out. Uh, oftentimes, sometimes they were wealthy herders, but they had all these people that worked for them or were extended family. They were socially not well, they were socially not very, um, uh, let's just say, among the delicate class because what happens when you hang around with sheep all the time? They were poor, desperately poor. And they were living under oppression too. You see, you know, in Jesus' day, there was no, uh, no idea, Israel was not a reality except for in the minds of some of the people. It was just a province of Rome under the boot of Rome who was being administrated through Cornarius, Cornarius of the, Syri the governor of Syria. Remember last chapter? 
Caesar Augustus sends a rule over. Quirinius says, all you people, every one of you, I don't care where you're from. You, or I don't care what you're doing, what you got going in your life. Every one of you, I want you uprooted. And I want all of you to travel back to where your family came from at the very beginning. I don't care what your excuses are, whether you got kids. Or, and they wanted a census so that they could know what they owned and what they had and how many people were there so they could tax them and control them. It's oppressive. These guys were living out as far as they could out of the loop. Poverty, classism. And maybe they hope for a deliverer like many people do and did. But as far as, but they were in darkness. And as far as we know, they weren't even looking for the light. Like one guy said, some people are so in such darkness, they don't they don't they don't they not only haven't seen the switch, they're, they're they not only haven't seen the light, they don't even believe it's a switch. There's truth to that. As far as we know, in the story, these shepherds hadn't been praying or thinking about such things, about something amazing happening. But here's the great thing. Whether you think about it, whether you wandered, whether you're just sitting out in the dark, or whether you just wandered into some small Baptist church in a small town today, it doesn't really matter because, you see, God is the initiator God initiated the work by speaking to them about their lives on his schedule, not theirs. And it was an amazing thing. He didn't go to palaces. We're so impressed. We're so celebrities, starstruck. But he went to the lowest people for a reason, because he came for the humble. He came for the people. And in the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened. It would be terrifying. Have you ever been out in the darkness in the woods and have somebody hit you with like one of these, these bad boys? This is not very bright, but it would, it would, when your eyes are not adjusted, it would freak you out. There's a darkness. There's darkness in the reality of life, but there's darkness, and they were in the type of darkness of their inner life, too. You know, many of you know what I'm talking about. Many of you find yourself in darkness today. You're in darkness. I mean, sin brings darkness. He says, we, we, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we'll have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from all sin. But if we, if we say we have not sinned, we walk in darkness. Darkness. And there's darkness of despair where you just, you just feel the weight of this, like you're kind of giving up. Or you feel disappointed. You know, this is a, did you know that this time of year is a really hard time of year for a lot of people? They're lonely. Are they're, they've had losses in their family. They've had death in their family. And there's a darkness. And, and it's hard to, you try to shake it off. You know, ho, 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 ho. You know, why, why won't you? And their days be merry and bright. You don't feel it. You're not, it's not your thing. It's not your jam. You feel darkness. Depression, it's a darkness. You just feel it. Don't get all over-spiritual on me. It's, it, you're like, well, I know that I feel kind of like I'm in darkness, but I know that I've given my life to the Lord, and I shouldn't. I don't even have the right to feel this way. That's a darkness too, by the way. And you feel the darkness and it's cold shadows falling on you and you just can't help it. And you don't want to be in that place. And you can't shake it any more than those shepherds could shake the night. You see, this is a part of the theme, remember? That's why he was saying that the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet in the way of peace. Wow, what a promise. And we all sit in darkness at different times. But you know, before anybody can really come into a relationship with the sunrise, 
you got to know you're in darkness. You got to come to face the fact that you need God, that you need his forgiveness, that you're a sinner, that darkness has got a grip on you. By the way, no matter what, your kind, what kind of darkness you're dealing with, it, before you can ever begin to deal with it, you got to deal with the fact that you're in it. The great thing is, is no matter what composes that darkness or what brings it in your life, God has a plan to save us and bring us to light. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. By the way, isn't that great? Isn't that a great, that comes up over and over again, that God doesn't, the, in, the, in, in the mix of the gospel, you live a life of anxiety, you're always keyed up, you're always worried about this and catastrophic and that. The reality is, is that God does not want you to live your life in fear. And if you're living your life in fear, you need to figure out what darkness is propelling that, that fear. And you need to get help to deal with it. You don't need to live a life of fear. And the reason why you don't need to live a life of fear, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. That term, the people, it literally means the folks, the common. And he is brought for you. This is good news for all people, common people. From the bottom all the way to the top, you're included. And no matter how small you may feel or how forgotten you may feel, you're not too small or you're not forgotten with God. And no matter how hidden you may feel, you're not hidden, you're not in a shadow, you're not invisible to God. As a matter of fact, I mentioned this last week that the only place in the Bible where these three titles are put in the same, in the same uh, verse, in the same spot, same phrase in the Bible, is right here, where Jesus was just born. The only place where you see these words, there is born to you a savior, a deliverer, somebody who will restore you out of evil, will forgive your sin, will, will save you from sin and from self. A savior who is Christ. He is the king. He's the one king. You know, people say there weren't many bad kings in the Bible. By the way, there were all bad kings in the Bible. There were some that were less bad, a couple of them. But they were all bad. You know why? Because kings were never God's plan. Remember? They demanded a king, and they ended up with Saul, and it was all downhill from there. The only king who was ever good is the king of kings. He's the Christ, the anointed one. As a matter of fact, isn't it interesting? <clears throat> one church father said, John of Damascus said, the anointer became the anointed. He was the anointed one. The only ruler, the only, you know, Jesus is the only ruler, political or otherwise, who deserves your, who, who deserves and rightly demands your absolute allegiance. Nobody else gets it or should even be close to it. And he is the Lord, Yahweh. He is, he is the Savior, born to you this day, a Savior who is Christ the Lord, who is God. And that brings the second thing about them that you can see. You must, when something happens in your life that, that challenges and scatters or even brings a slight crack of light across your life, when something like that happens, you have to see it. You have to be willing to see it. When that message comes to you, doesn't matter where it comes from, you have to be willing to hear it. It doesn't matter whether it's angels, which was awesome. I'm in. I'd like to see that. Or it's creation. The heavens declare the glory of God and his firmament, firmament is handiwork. The invisible attributes of God are clearly seen in that which he has made. But you have to have ears, like Jesus said. You have to be willing to say, Lord, give me ears to hear and give me eyes to see. That's why you need to pay attention. And it's hard to pay attention in a tech-mad world where we're constantly distracted. 
You need to pay attention for when you least expect it, God is going to break through in the silence of your life, in a moment in your life, in a point of darkness in your life. When God, Listen, ask yourself this. How is God speaking to you? Shut the radio off. Shut the Christian station off and get silent. And why don't you let God speak to you? And you know how God speaks to us almost always in our darkness. And you are in darkness. Some of you are sitting in the middle of the darkness of your difficulty. You're sitting in the darkness of your confusion and your disorientation. Let me ask you a question. Are you listening? Are you just raging against the darkness? This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. God shows us and just like those first followers once he shows you something big, small, no matter who he uses, whether he uses, you don't know how God's going to speak to you. Listen, God might speak through your mother-in-law. Yes. God might speak through one of your kids. God might speak through somebody, you, your enemy. God might speak through some person who doesn't even believe what you believe, but that doesn't mean God can't speak through them. And once God does speak to you and show you something, even if it's painful, you have to take action right now. Those early disciples, those first followers of Jesus, they were shepherds, they were nobodies, but they take action. You see, the key to faith is to act now. Faith is is almost always used in a verb tense. That means it is an action word. You need to do it. Do it. And when God shows you something, the time to act, ma'am, the time to act is right now not later. God's never early and he's never late. He shows you something because time is of importance. You have to act when God is speaking. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, hey, let's go straight to Bethlehem then. Let's take the short route. And see this thing that has happened, with the, what the Lord has made known to us. God has made something known to you. Now you need to act on it. So they came in a hurry and they found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby who lay in the manger. And once you have followed him on this level and you see the follower does something always, not even intentionally, they tell the story. They tell the story. That's what happens. You see, when they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about the Christ. And all, that, all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. You see, you know, you tell your story. You tell your own story. And there's some reasons why. When you tell your own story, it helps you sort it out. And if you don't tell your story to your kids or to your grandkids or to your friends or to your siblings or to whoever, if you don't tell your story about out of your darkness how God spoke to you and how God showed you the way of peace, out of your darkness how God gave you direction on what to do and how you followed him and what God did and what he further showed you, because light received brings more light, light rejected brings more darkness. When you do that, you begin to remember how God has met you. And if you do not tell your story, who's going to tell your story? Nobody's going to tell your story. If you don't talk to your sons and daughters and your granddaughters and grandsons and your friends, if you don't tell about your story, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to even make sense all the time. Just tell your story. Don't skip the details. Don't skip the reality of its darkness. It was part of it. If you don't tell it, who tells it? But when you remember it, you remember how God has met you and how he brought the sunrise to your life. The outcome is always praise and worship, the last thing for the day. 
You know, the shepherds told them and people were like, wow, that's amazing. And the shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for, they, for, for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. They praised God. They couldn't help it. We cannot help but speak what we've seen and heard. That's what he, Luke says later to the apostles about them. There was praise and there was glorifying God. Now, it doesn't say music. Were they singing? Were they dancing? I don't know. But even the heavenly hosts, it doesn't say there was music. It just says there were a chorus, which is probably a reference to the Greek chorus, where in like Greek theater, they would have a group of voices that would all speak in unison, but it didn't involve music. Praise. Are you a person that praises much? You glorify God? No, there's nothing wrong with song and dance and worship. But there's this testifying. And when you share your story, when you tell your story, what it does is it reminds you of the goodness of God and the greatness of God and the mystery of God. You know, God is mysterious to us. You know, people, I heard a guy say the other day, he was describing how he came to faith in Christ. And he says, even to this day, it's a mystery to me. <laughs> I still don't know how it happened. <laughs> you know, it's not some reductionist, rational, four-step process. It's a mystery of magnificence of God. And so, when you testify, you can't help it. And so let me, let me just say this. We all sit in darkness we can all stray into the shadows and delude ourselves and get deeper into the darkness because light rejected brings more darkness. Light received and responded to brings more light. We all can sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. But God has a plan. He has a plan for you to save you and to bring you light. And you say, well, I've already been saved. Yeah, but he's still saving you. You've been saved. He's saving you. He will save you. God, is, this is a journey. This is where we meet him on the road. God has a plan to save us, and he brings us to light. He's the true light that lighteth the way of every man, he says. And light came into the world, and the darkness was not able to overcome it. In fact, Jesus' plan for us not just to experience the sunrise of his light in our life, but Jesus' plan was to help you become, through him, the light of the world. A light, you don't put a bushel over it, he said. He said, you are the light of the world. You put it on a hill, you put it on a lampstand where all can see it. That's what his plan was. So, you find yourself in darkness, you don't have to stay there. He'll meet you there. As a matter of fact, you know where he meets all of us? In darkness. That's when we meet him. I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes if you would. And I'd like to ask you a question. Just be honest today. I'm not going to, this is not a Baptist preacher trick I'm going to do on you here. not going to drag you down to the front or do anything like that. I mean, if you want to come be prayed for, you can, but this doesn't involve that. You're here, and you, um, you say, you know, I feel like I'm in darkness. I didn't say you got to reason it all out. You feel like you're in darkness. You know a bunch of stuff about God, but you feel like you're in darkness. And you need the light of Christ in your life. Now maybe you've given your life to Christ or maybe you haven't. But whatever the case, your personal experience right now is you feel you are in darkness. It might be you're discouraged or you're despondent or you're, you're, you're disoriented. I don't know what it is. You know, but right now you feel that you are in darkness in some way. And you want me to pray for you that he would bring light 
and you want me to do that, you feel you're in darkness and you want me to pray for you, just slip up your hand where you are. Wherever you are, I'm not going to embarrass you. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? You feel you're in darkness. Someone else? Some, you're in a dark place right now. Maybe nobody else knows it. Thank you. Nobody else knows about it. You can't tell them. They would like, that's, that's, they would say, they'd say, well, you shouldn't feel that way. And you can't shake it off. You can't think your way out of it. There's, he needs to meet you in that place, and he will. That's what he does. I don't know how, and I don't know when, and I don't know through who or through what, but I'm going to pray that, and here's the thing, when he does it, you'll know he did it. There may be a process. There may be, he's going to say, okay, I've given you light. Now you need to do this. You need to get some help, or you need to talk to someone, or you need to take this next step. Go to Bethlehem and see, he may say. <laughs> But let me tell you something. When he tells you to do something, it's always good news for you. It's always good news for you. Always. Because whenever he comes, he comes as a Savior, as the Christ, and as the Lord. Lord, I pray for my dear friends here. And a lot of them are in different places in their life. It's so hard to humble ourselves and be like those shepherds sitting in darkness we got no standing we got nothing to bargain with and yet not because they deserved it or we deserve it or my friends deserve it just because they're there <laughs> because they're in that humble place You send your message, the angelos. Light. Bring light, Lord. Bring light to my friends. For those who are in depression or confusion or disorientation or disappointment with themselves or with life or with whatever. For those that are in doubt deep doubt about what they believe or if they believe anything. Bring them light, Lord. They can't get their way out. They can't, they can't find their way out. They walk in darkness right now. But, they, but you offer light. So bring them light. You are the light of the world. And we know, know that light, the darkness has no defense against light. So I pray, Lord, that you would do that. And help them. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to look at that beautiful card. Would somebody hold up your card? The little Oh, it's red. It's very festive. Hold up that red card. Isn't that great? Now I want you to send me a Christmas card. <laughs> but it's going to be a response card, okay? I'd like you to fill out this card. And here's some responses. I am in darkness and I need the light of Christ. Man, we'll pray for you. And I don't know whether that's the light for salvation. You need to be born again. Or you just got yourself in and you're down and you're in the shadows. I want to tell you, he'll bring you out of that. I'm hearing and believing. Amen. We'll pray for you. I need, by, I need to blank by faith now. <laughs> so you fill in the blank, whatever you're dealing with. We'll, uh, we'll pray for you. I commit to tell the story, man. Do the story. This, tell your story. Tell the story around Christmas. Tell your kids how you came to know Jesus. Or maybe you're putting them down to sleep at night. Say, let me tell you my story. If you don't tell it, who's going to tell it? I want to be baptized as soon as possible. You say, well, that's very Baptist. It is. But the, one of the first ways you tell your story is by getting baptized. 
So while you fill that out, I'll play this little song I wrote a few years ago, at least a couple verses. Sometimes I find myself in darkness. Sometimes my eyes can dimly see. Sometimes my sight, it just seems to fade away. But I always feel your hand holding me. I always feel your hand. I always feel your hand, oh Lord. I always feel your hand holding me. Holding me. You're holding me. Holding me. You're holding me. Holding me. You're holding me. I always feel your hand holding me. Oh, Lord, I hear you calling me. Hear you calling in the weeping of the willow tree at dawn. Oh, Jesus, I believe in you. Can't keep from crying when I think of all the pain you knew for so long. And I know I'll always stand beside you. And I know I'll always keep your light a growing in my mind. Oh, Lord, I hear you calling me. Hear you calling in the weeping of the willow tree at dawn. 